impact that it has on our families, and how do we do it? Well, by sharing our own personal experiences, it becomes powerful, it becomes meaningful, I think. By sharing our hope and our wisdom, uh, by sharing the love that we have, the goal is that you, as family members, understand what you're looking at and realize that you can do well. We want to demonstrate to you hope what recovery looks like. Um, we started these meetings, the family support meetings, last year, the year before, time is flying, maybe a little bit before, but it's second and fourth Tuesday of every month. Um, the meetings are open, as you've seen, for anyone that's affected by addiction. We want people to know that you're not alone in this, and that there is a support system that's based in love and hope to give you a meaningful way to become healthy. Makes sense. Right? Arvo and I, we could not do it alone. Ron could not do it alone in our own personal journeys. We needed help. We're here to help you. Okay? We have, in the first part of these meetings, we have very talented colleagues that come to share um, different aspects about treatment and prevention and recovery. Um, we have Ian with us again, and Lindsay will introduce. But, um, we're grateful for that. And then after our educational piece, we break out into groups, and I just love that part. Because then we get to hear from you. We can hear what's on your heart, we can hear how addiction, it does affect you, and give you an educated plan, again, that's based in love and wisdom to help you move forward. That's what hope does, okay? And then we'll come back in here. I like to come back just for a couple minutes after our groups to share some takeaways from tonight. So. With that, thank you again for being here. We appreciate you all. Let me introduce, oh, Lindsay's on crutches. This is Lindsay. Hello. So welcome. I want to thank everybody for coming, um, especially all the newcomers. Welcome, and we hope that you keep coming back and bring your friends and your family also. Um, we like to grow. We like to share the love and the hope with everybody in the community. Um, I would like to introduce our very special friend and speaker tonight, Ian Koch. Ian um, runs Surfside Recovery. Um, and without further ado, I'm going to introduce Ian. Yay! Uh, hello, everybody. My name is Ian Koch. Like Lindsay said, thanks for having me up. <coughs> Guys, thank you as well. Uh, I've been up here a couple times. I am a licensed clinical drug and alcohol counselor. I'm a nationally certified addiction specialist. I'm the executive director of Surfside Recovery Services and Surfside Structured Sober Living. We are a nonprofit down in Ventnor, uh, New Jersey. We do a couple different things. One of the things is we have a young adult adventure based non clinical extended care. And on the other end of things, uh, I do stuff like this. We work with a lot of families on helping them navigate the system, getting them appropriate resources, <coughs> services, et cetera, et cetera. I do some lecturing in different treatment centers and things of that nature. So. Um, interventions, case management, and kind of a whole bunch of different things. So I came up, uh, I've already forgotten my topic, uh, I think it was... <laughs> the progression of the disease of addiction. Thank you, the progression of, a the, pro the progression of the disease of addiction, which is not only a mouthful, uh, but a pretty aggressive big topic. I have 20 minutes, uh, which I tend longer. Oh longer than 20 minutes. Uh, last time, if you were here the last time I spoke, I should apologize now, I was not in good spirits. Uh, we had someone pass away that was pretty close to us and there was a whole bunch of other drama and it all kind of hit at once. And um, I was very raw and very emotional and not too thrilled with the state of addiction uh, services out there and some days I'm still not too thrilled with it. So, uh, my experience in a nutshell is that uh, I've worked in addiction for about 15 years. Uh, I have a uh, sobriety date that is March 7th, 2005. So I've been clean for 13 years. Yes, there is a discrepancy uh, in those numbers and, and it has to really do with this whole progression of addiction and the way this stuff works. I think a lot of it has to do with the state of delusion. Uh, the difference between denial and delusion is denial uh, we know something is false, but we kind of hold our guns. 
uh, and try to pretend that it's it's not false, where delusion we legitimately don't know uh, that it is a state of delusion. And, and that was very much my experience. I was working uh, with young adults, well, I was actually working with youth at a homeless youth shelter uh, while I was selling cocaine and doing a whole bunch of other things. Uh, never did I think that there was any sort of problem with that. Um, I was getting a bachelor's degree in social work. Uh, one of the times I got arrested, I was actually locked up and I was in the back of the uh, car, drunk as a skunk and trying to kick out the windows as I was crying and screaming, you can't do this because I'm a social worker and that doesn't, you know, uh, really delusional. I mean, really and truly delusional about my life and what was going on. And, and like I, I legitimately just didn't know. You know I, I didn't know what I didn't know. And, and my experience very much was that, you know, I was raised in a, in a great family, typical uh, middle class America. My mom was home in the summers, you know, my dad was home by three o'clock in the afternoon. Like I grew up on a farm in the middle of nowhere, Pennsylvania, uh, north of Allentown. They had me working by the age of 14. I had my working papers and had a job at Thorny Park and Wild Water Kingdom. Like I was raised in a good family. My father was the main judge of Allentown, uh, Pennsylvania for uh, years. You know, you walk in to this day, you walk into the courthouse and his picture's on the wall. And I was not like that. You know, I was, I was different. Uh, apparently, uh, if you shake my family tree, there's gonna be alcoholics and addicts that pop out, uh, but there's no necessarily clear line in my family. So, you know, again, I, I didn't know what I didn't know, and my parents didn't know what they didn't know either, and I was seeing drug and alcohol counselors from the time I was 14 uh, until I got clean, and, and a lot of them told me some really great information primarily to stop using. The probation officers also said, Ian, you need to stop using. And I would think to myself, that's a, that's a great idea. I wish I would have thought of that. You know, maybe I wouldn't have gotten arrested that time again. But I couldn't seem to, I couldn't seem to stop using. It wasn't, um, it wasn't necessarily in my wheelhouse. It wasn't, uh, I couldn't just like turn the, sh the, the switch off. And I think, and I say it a lot, of, a lot of the times, you know, we look back on Nancy Reagan and she had a really uh, great idea, which is that we were all just gonna say no. And uh, we were gonna put our foot down and we weren't gonna pick up again and that was gonna be that. And that whole mindset has completely drifted away because just saying no for someone who's suffering from addiction just isn't an option. Uh, there has to be more. So, <clears throat> I don't, uh, I'm probably gonna, I might want to use what I have over here, but I may not, so I'm gonna hold myself from going to it right away, and, uh, whatever. Um, a lot of people, when they talk about the progression of addiction, they talk about it from a standpoint of the brain and brain chemistry and things of that nature. And it's good information. But I've, I literally have lectured on a weekly basis in at least one treatment center for the past 10 years. Never once have I met uh, an addict or an alcoholic who's relapsing and can't stay clean. Say to me, you know what? That last time I was just thinking, you know, my dopamine levels were off. Um, I could feel my neurons not firing appropriately. So I decided to pick up a drink. But I've met, no one's ever said that. Uh, in treatment centers, we spend a lot of time talking about when the bad things happen, the person is going to pick up again, right? So we want to avoid that, that bad moment, that, that trigger we just had. But the truth is, is a lot of people don't actually relapse over bad things. Um, I've been in a million 12-step meetings, and I've heard it over and over again. You know, somebody's suffering, and they lost their job, so they're going to more meetings, and they're calling their sponsor more, and they're, they're plugging into their network more, and they're trying to engage. But I've never heard anyone say, you know, man, I've got this great girl and whew, things are really, really good at home, especially after hours and I just got a raise at work and I got a new car, so I'm doubling up on my meetings and I'm calling my sponsor more. <coughs> never do I hear that, right? Because there's something that happens, there's a gap from when the person gets clean to when they relapse, right? It's like, we see it a lot in treatment centers. You know, Johnny or, or Jenny, they walk into treatment and they're getting through detox, and a couple days through <coughs> detox, 
They start to feel better and all of a sudden, five, six days clean, all of a sudden they're at the case manager's office, they gotta go home, they've got stuff to do, they, they gotta pay the Comcast bill, the grass needs to be mowed, they gotta get back to work, all of a sudden all these things, right? Where five days before that, they're begging to get it, right? Because they just can't stop using. My point is that staying sober, uh, or, or the problem is not getting clean, right? The problem is not getting sober, the problem is staying sober. That, that seems to be the trick. And, and again, if, if being clean or, or being sober was the answer, we would only have one type of addiction service. And that service would be called detox. And you would go to detox, and you would get clean, and you'd get on with your day. And it would be that simple. Yet, I mean, some of you who've experienced this, whether it's a loved one or personally, sometimes it's detox after detox after detox after detox after detox. After detox. You know, and, and I would also challenge uh, all of you to think about your loved one who's been suffering or currently suffering. You know, when they pick up again, is their life in complete turmoil? Or do things start to be going well? Right? Do they get another job? Do they get a car again? Do they start working, right? Does, do things start coming back to them? Like, what, what do those experiences look like? So, in 12-step recovery, in, in the NA basic text, uh, somewhere around page 2021, it talks about three aspects to the disease. And it talks about a physical component, they talk about a mental component, and they talk about a spiritual component. In, in the Alcoholics Anonymous book, uh, they talk about something called the phenomenon of craving, the mental obsession, and the spiritual malady. And ultimately, regardless of what you call them, they're, they're three uh, integral pieces to the puzzle, right? And the first, the first is this physical component, and it's not withdrawal. It's not being dope sick. It's not shaking from the booze. The physical component is a compulsion to use once you've started to use, where... So my mother, my mother recently had a knee surgery. And uh, in her knee surgery, uh, she, I called, you know, to see how she was doing. And, and she said, I said, well, what did they prescribe for pain? And she said, oh, well, they prescribed Percocet, five milligram pills. I said, well, how many did you get? She says, well, I'm supposed to take two every four hours. But... I'm only taking two before physical therapy and I'm taking two before I go to bed. So she had the surgery last week. I called her two nights ago. I said, so how you doing? How the meds? Da, 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 da. She said, oh, well, I stopped taking the meds three days ago. I said, why? She said, well, I'm in pain, but I don't think I really need them. So I flushed them. Okay. My grandmother, uh, she had a hip surgery. Uh, she called my mom a couple times, this was maybe a year or so ago, and she called my mother and she was complaining how much pain she was in. And uh, basically, she, uh, my mom, so she called my mom, my mom said, well, are you taking your meds? And she said, oh no, I forgot all about them. So my mom had to start calling her, you know, every four hours to take the meds to remind her to take the pills. My aunt had scoliosis. She has a scar from the tip of her, the top of her spine, to the bottom of her buttocks, or the top of her buttocks. Uh, she took Percocet for two days and decided she didn't like the way it made her feel, and she got rid of it. My father drank two beers a day almost every single day uh, until he retired, and then he got crazy and switched it up and would drink a Bloody Mary, uh, and then about three hours later would drink like a vodka tonic. When my father makes a drink, he uses a jigger. For those of you who know what a jigger is, he pours off one level shot of vodka, pours it in the glass, fills the rest up with the mixer, and has his drink, and that's it. I've seen him uh, tipsy twice. When I make a drink, I fill the jigger up with the mixer, pour that in, and then I fill the rest of the glass up with the booze. Right? When I get a, a script of pills, my experience was... Uh, I would pick them up at the pharmacy, and as I'm walking through the parking lot, I would open them up, and I would take a couple, and then I would get in my car, right? And then I would take a couple more, and I would think, all right, that's it. I'm gonna make the I'm gonna make the rest last. And I would get home, and I would think, well, then I can have one more now, and then I'll and then I'll really make them last for the rest, you know. And then I wake up the next day, and I think, well, let me just have two. I still got a bunch left. 
And then by noon, it's another one or two, it, you know, and it, and it just snowballs and four days, five days go by, a 30 day script is gone. And I think to myself, now I gotta go find him somewhere else. When I drink alcohol, I tend to go to the liquor store and I always underestimate myself, even though I don't think I'm underestimating myself and I buy a six pack and I go home and shortly later I'm down at the liquor store buying a 12 pack and a bottle of tequila, right? I always, or when I buy a lot of booze, I always have the intention of just having a couple, but when I have a couple, I get thirsty and I have a couple more, right? I've never gone out and bought 24 waters and sat down and drank 24 bottles of water, right? Because I don't have this, this physical component with water. I don't experience it with caffeine either. You know, if, if I have a coffee in the morning, I may have, if, it, if it's like a crazy day and I'm exhausted, I may have three, maybe four more throughout the day. But honestly, I can't tell you the last time I've had five regular sized cups of coffee in a day. I had two today, I think I had two the day before, probably two the day before that. But I, I can control my caffeine intake. I can control my water intake. But for some reason, this physical component that is talked about in the 12-step literature is an inability to stop when the person started. I like the language of AA uh, slightly better than NA because it it's calls it a phenomenon of craving. And when we look at this idea of a progression, a phenomenon fits in really well because a phenomenon is something we can see happen but we can't explain. And a craving means we want more. It's a phenomenon that a heroin addict smokes a little pot when they get out of treatment and shortly after is using heroin. But that's not a normal, like the state of Colorado is not, not everyone who smoked pot is shooting heroin today. Let's be clear. There's a whole lot of people who were thrilled that pot became legal and they started smoking pot and that was that, right? But I can't tell you how many people I've met who've gotten out of treatment with the idea that they're gonna smoke pot or they're just gonna have a drink of alcohol and they do and then they end up using heroin shortly after, if not immediately after. Right, that is a phenomenon, right? It's something that's observable, it's something we can see, it's crystal clear. There's probably a reason why that has to do with the brain but the truth is most people when they go and pick up again, they're not paying attention. The mental part of this, this illness is this uh, inability to look at the consequences before they pick up, right? So this happens from a moment of sobriety, right? And, and I'm gonna show a video about this, uh, kind of about this, that will illustrate in a few minutes. But this is, this is the piece where someone says, and you've heard it, I'm not gonna do that again. And when they say it, the intention is, is true and it's pure and they, they believe it from the depths of their being Yet for some reason, they pick up again. Right? And you ask them, well, why did you do it again? And they give you the blank stare, like, I don't know. And that's probably the truth. They probably don't know. Right? We talk about, we call it the mental obsession. Uh, and typically when people hear the word obsession, they think of this like nonstop, all day long, daunting feeling and experience. But that's not necessarily an obsession. An obsession, by definition, is an idea that outweighs all other ideas. So if someone gets hit with an obsession, like if I get hit with an obsession, I have to go. And I make up some sort of excuse to leave, whatever that may be, but I got other plans and I don't care what I have to do, I'm out what? the door. That's, that's the obsession when it comes to addiction. And, and think, about, think about what you've experienced with your loved ones, and that's, that's the folks who are leaving treatment after five days of being there because the, some insignificant $20 bill has to get paid. I mean, we all know if you're late on a bill, even a couple months, it's not that big of a deal. Yet, in that moment, it's a huge ordeal for them. And then shortly later, they're back in the same situation. The mental obsession does not respond to reasoning. It is also separate than a thought. Like if I say pink elephant, or tequila, or Patron tequila, or heroin, you've all thought about those things. It's very different than an actual obsession. Right? An obsession is an idea that outweighs all other ideas, and it's uncontrollable, and it's not stoppable. Right? The third part of this illness, uh, and, and in the NA basic text, it talks about an intense self-centeredness. 
In the AA literature, it also talks about it being self-centered, and it talks about it being a, a restlessness and irritability and a discontent. And, and what, it, what it is describing is an internal condition prior to picking up the substance. Right? So we admitted we were powerless over our addiction, dash, that our lives had become unmanageable. All this translates to the family as well. The unmanageability is, is that moment of complete uh, angst and irritability and discontent. And then the mind says, well, maybe I can have just one, or maybe I should just call him to see where they are. Maybe I should just check in on him. I haven't heard from him all day. Maybe I should just see what's going on. And then that moment happens, and then, then that physical piece kicks in. Right? The, the translation is very, very much the same for families as to, as to, um, to addicts and alcoholics. That, that unmanageability is from a state of sobriety. The biggest piece of this whole progression is that we're under the impression that being sober is going to keep us sober. Yet we get sober, and that's when that restlessness, that irritability, and that discontent kicks in, and things aren't good enough, and the job's not good enough, and the husband's not good enough, and the girlfriend's not good enough, and da 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 and the list goes on and on and on and on and on. And eventually the mind says, well, maybe I can have just one. Or the mind says, well, I'm not going to do any of those. I wasn't really an alcoholic anyway. I can have a beer. Or, well, pot's going to be legal in New Jersey soon enough anyway, so what's the... Uh, it's, I have some sort of illness no one's ever heard about, so I can legally smoke weed because it's a medicinal use, whatever nonsense, right? And then the person ingests the substance, and then once they ingest the substance, they can't seem to stop. This, this is the progression of the illness. The reason we're having so much trouble, now this, this is kind of what I wanted to talk about. So this is on our website, uh, and we have a pretty extensive blog section. Uh, under blog, the website structured soberliving.com. This article is it's called If 28 Days in Addiction Treatment Doesn't Seem to Work, and then it basically is subtitled Rethinking the Landscape of Addiction Treatment. So I'm gonna come back to that. That's Bart Simpson being arrested. Here we go. I think it's that good. So if you've not seen this, or if you've seen this before, just write it out. Um. This is a test of selective attention. Count how many times the players wearing white passed the basketball. How many passes did you count? 14. 24. Hold on. <laughs> I heard 14. I heard 44. I heard 24. I heard 16. I heard 13. A bunch of 14s. <laughs> Hold on. So the correct, the correct answer is 15. We didn't hear 15. Did you see the gorilla? How many of you saw the gorilla? Raise your hand if you saw the gorilla. So one, hold on, put your hands up for the film. Put one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. Um, keep your hands up. Remember 15? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, nine. So 25 did not see the gorilla. 15 saw the gorilla. Right there. Right dead center. <laughs> so less less video is from research by Daniel Simons and Christopher Chabri and is copyrighted. So less than half the group saw saw the gorilla. Okay? Why is what does this have to do with anything? 
All right. So I stumbled across some of this stuff fairly recently, and to me it answered a ton of stuff. There's something called the forgetting curve. And what the forgetting curve is, is, is this doesn't have to do with your, whether you're an addict or an alcoholic, but the forgetting curve has to do with this phenomenon where 70% of what you hear in the last hour, you will forget. All right? So we started roughly 7 o'clock. By 8 o'clock, you will forget 70% of what I had to say. So the good news is <laughs> I've lost almost all anxiety about public speaking. <laughs> because you're not going to remember anyway. I mean, really, you're going to remember whether I was worth listening to or whether I was not worth listening to. Uh, I was telling Arvo how I lecture in these treatment centers, and I talk about literally the same thing every week, week after week after week after week. And every week I start with the same thing. Does anybody remember what I talked about last week? And everyone looks at me like I'm crazy. Because the way the forgetting curve works is that, that normal, healthy folks forget 70% of what happens in the last hour and roughly around, I think it's like three days later, you forget 90% of that information. So you're, you basically your takeaway is 10%. So now let's take this into addiction. If you're going to forget 70% of what happened here, what's that say for if someone does 30 days in treatment? What's that say for someone who like does 30 days and gets sober? And maybe a couple months out, they stop going to meetings and they stop doing the things they're supposed to do. <laughs> And a year goes by and all of a sudden they relapse and everyone's all upset again. I mean, if, if someone stops doing this stuff, they're not going to remember anything. I was, as I was like starting to really look into some of this, I happened to be at a 12-step uh, meeting and, and the speaker said she was a chronic relapser and she was talking about she actually collected like six months sober and was like going to meetings and things. And then she started using again and... And she said something about she used for almost another two years, and over the course of that two years, it never even occurred to her to go back to 12-step recovery. Like, she forgot that she ever even had that, that six months. One of the main things you're going to hear in 12-step in recovery, one of the main things you're going to hear in treatment centers, is that you need to remember how bad it was. You need to think it through, they say, or, or remember the last drink, or remember the last drug. What the 12 step literature actually says is that it's at certain times it's not possible to remember the suffering of a week or a month ago. Mm -hmm. Yet for some reason we take, we take this information and we push it aside and think that willpower is going to be enough to think through actual addiction. Like the truth is they're not even going to remember they had a problem in the big picture. This is the only fatal progressive illness that tells you you're fine and you don't have a problem. It's the only one. This information sucks. And there's really no other way like to say it. You know, like this is, this is really, the, it's a first step experience. <clears throat> Right? It's really it's an experience with true powerlessness. You know, it's an experience that, that should feel hopeless. Because that, that is the powerlessness of addiction. You know, the fact that somebody a week out is going to remember a couple things. They're going to remember if they were there and if they weren't there. They're going to probably remember if the food was decent or if the food wasn't, right? They're gonna have a whole bunch of uh, random stories that mean nothing about nothing. And then they're gonna, they're gonna get out and the family's gonna be frustrated with them and, and wonder why they end up doing it again. And, and the reality of it is, is if you're a healthy, healthy functioning adult, you're still stuck with this whole thing, this forgetting curve, this phenomenon. 
part of what determines whether somebody forgets, right? So how do we, so if the, if the problem is that people forget, right? The solution by default is like help them remember, okay? The factors, the key factors that determine whether someone is gonna forget is directly proportionate to uh, the moment of intake, we'll call that, right? So if at seven o'clock is the moment of intake, and, and actually right now is, is another moment of intake, so 8.43 is the other, the end of this hour, right? That, the information, whether it's retained or not, are gonna be determined by multiple factors. Some of those factors are how well the information is being uh, projected, right? How, how engaging is the person? The only, I typically walk around quite a bit, and the only reason I'm not is out of respect for the live feed. It's actually killing me. I'm like shifting back and forth. Um, but when I typically do this stuff in, in programs, I walk all around the room, I get behind people, I read, I talk, I engage people, I ask questions, I do all this stuff. And that helps to, to keep people engaged. So one, one factor is how engaging is the information. The other factor is how, um, how is the information being received? So imagine this. Johnny's 22 years old. He's been using heroin for two years. His life has been a mess. He ends up in treatment. He meets Jenny. Jenny is a beautiful little blonde, 21 years old. They sit by each other in group, pass notes, tickle when the therapist is not paying attention, you know? When the therapist is, is doing the lecture, they kind of talk like this and show a PowerPoint on triggers and the, and the addiction disease. And then Johnny leaves and Johnny gets high again and his family is wondering what just happened. He never, he never had a fight in the shop. I mean, this is, this is just like, we're set up and I, and I, always, I always go back to seemingly talking about the problem, and I talk about the problem because if people are educated on the problem, then people can look for solutions. I don't have all the solutions. But there needs to be engaging mm -hmm. programs that are long-term. And I'm not even saying residential, I'm saying long-term. The reason folks do well in 12-step recovery, and it's why I always recommend 12-step recovery, even over things like smart recovery, like I, I really try to recommend like fellowship driven programs is because if someone can create a fellowship, like a network, like that is, is more of a day to day calling, texting, what's up, let's go here, let's do this, let's, you know what I mean? It's not just a like one hour boom. You know, it's, it's more sustainable. And it's why folks who, who tend to be heavily engaged in 12 step recovery tend to stay sober. Now I don't have the statistics for the folks who are staying sober who are not in 12 step recovery or those types of fellowships because I don't, I don't know them. But I can tell you this, is that uh, I'm not super shy about my anonymity. I have no reason to be. And in my travels and meeting people and other aspects of my life, I go to the gym, I uh, kite surf, I surf, I do all these things and I talk to people and, and I've never, I've, not never, very, very rarely do I meet someone who identifies as being in recovery who doesn't also identify to go into some sort of 12-step fellowship. Yes, they are out there. I, there's one at the gym. But that one at the gym even said he did 12-step recovery for quite a long time and still is a network of those people. In those networks, in doing that like weekly or daily or that consistent thing, and whether consistent is two times a week or once a week or five days a week, it doesn't matter, consistency, right? In doing the consistency, it's a consistent reminder. You know, and they say it in 12-step recovery, we have a built-in forgetter. But I've seen this stuff over and over and over. This, all this information, go research it, the forgetting curve. All this information backs why like some of these little things that have been said year after year after year, I mean, 12-step fellowships are 70, 80 years old. You know, it's like why this stuff is said because it, it consistently works. You know, we, we are, as an industry, we are, the pharmaceutical company has made this thing a disaster and the pharmaceutical company is trying to clean it up. That's a problem. You can't fix dumb with stupid. It doesn't work. 
I'm not saying medicated assisted treatment is bad at all. I'm a proponent of some of this stuff in appropriate areas. In appropriate areas. But Suboxone and Buke was designed to be a short-term deal. Methadone was designed to be given to 20-year-plus heroin addicts. Vivitrol is fantastic for 16 to 20 days. And you can still smoke crack, and you can still smoke pot, and you can still do an array of other things. You know, like, the pharmaceutical company, the way I see it, is pushing these substances as the fix and the cure-all, not saying they're bad. They're a fantastic leg up. They're a fantastic leg up. But they're not the end goal. Like gabapentin is a medication that's being pumped out of treatment centers. They're showing that gabapentin uh, does something to the, the pathways in the brain where you can't actually learn new behavior. Like I've watched, and I've watched it for years. Guys get out of treatment, they're on gabapentin, they've been on gabapentin for years, they can't stay sober, they're chronic relapsers, they will not give up the gabapentin. It, not only is it abusable, but Maybe there is a correlation. Maybe, maybe they're never actually going to get clean because they don't know how to be vulnerable. Right? That, that ability to surrender and try new things that don't look cool or are perceived as being fun from the outside. Like, if that medication is potentially uh, inhibiting, is that the right word? Yeah. Enabling? Not enabling? Whatever. Not allowing uh, new pathways in the brain to be formed. Like, what are we actually doing? Like, think about that. Think about it. Loved ones are going into treatment centers. They're being prescribed medications that are potentially hurting their progress when they leave. Not intentionally. None of it's done intentionally. It's done out of a lack of information. It's done out of an old model of how to reimburse a DSM code. And we need to think outside the box. And we need to raise money for lobbyists. And we need to raise money for different types of programs. We need new services, right? If you hear somebody say, like, we need more beds, that is not a true statement. Be informed. We don't need more beds in the state of New Jersey. We need more free beds. If somebody has insurance or money, if 10 people walked up to me right now and said, I have money or insurance, and they needed to go to treatment, I could get them a bed somewhere in the state of New Jersey within an hour probably get them a ride there from the facility. Mm -hmm. If 10 people walked up to me without insurance, it's a whole nother ballgame. Right? So we have people lobbying and saying, we're going to open new facilities in your town near you. We've got uh, two coming in to, between Atlantic County uh, and, and Ocean County. But they're all based on a very small percentage of folks. Surfside does not, it can't help everybody. You know, the part of our program just, it's feasibly not financially available for everybody. We understand that. You know, it, it's, but we need better services. You know, and we need more free services. So be informed. Don't take the takeaway from this, and I didn't write it in the thing, but really the takeaway from all this is don't just take information at face value. Don't just assume that, that somebody saying it means it's the truth. <coughs> Do the research. Find out what it means when someone says we need blank or this is what blank is. Right? It's how Florida got in the mess that Florida's in and Southern California got in the mess that Southern California's in. You know, they got in the mess because it takes approximately a week to three weeks to open up a treatment center. I mean, how can you, how can you build ethically based programs that quick? You know? um, there's a lot of really great services and a lot of really great programs that come up here, they are really a good positive source to make that happen. You can always reach out for help with us. We can help point in the direction. Um, I hope you got something from this that's not too daunting. Uh, please look at our website, look at the blog section. There's a ton of information on there um, that explains some of this stuff about step one related to CBT, step two related to CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy how this stuff is really able to be applicable. 12-step uh, programs are not outdated. Uh, they're open for everyone, agnostic, atheist, none of that particularly matters. You just need to be able to fit the puzzle pieces together. Um, 
Do we want to do questions or how do you want to do it? Does anybody have any questions? I just want you to talk a little bit to the family members about what an open meeting looks like. Mm. Because that's where I found a lot of comfort and I definitely found recovery there, even though it wasn't my meeting, but just the idea of that fellowship and keeping it raw. So maybe just two seconds on. Regardless of the fellowship, open meetings are for anybody who attend. Closed meetings are for addicts or alcoholics only. <laughs> or for that matter, Naranon or Alanon members only. If you're going to an open meeting and you're a family member and it's an actual like AA meeting or NA meeting, it does not give you the ability to share. And quite honestly, when they pass a basket, do not put money in the basket because it is a seventh tradition they're supporting by their own membership. So if you're a family member and you're not an addict and you're putting money in the basket, that's actually counterproductive to that principle. So don't do that. But open meetings are for anybody to attend. Closed meetings are for alcoholics and addicts only. Vice versa with Alan and Narnon. And what do they talk about there? Alan and Narnon? No, no, no. That, the open meeting that you go to, what, what does that look like? I mean, it depends on the open meeting. I mean, meetings... So my, my crusade as someone who helps families is to try to get more families to not only engage in 12-step fellowships like Naranon and Alanon, but to actually get sponsors and work the 12 steps and find the freedom that is available. Every meeting is different. So you may have a literature-based meeting that has books being read and then people talk about it. You may have a speaker meeting that is a short speaker and then a discussion. You may have an hour speaker, which is a full speaker. Some meetings have breaks. Uh, some meetings just throw out random topics and people talk to them about them. It doesn't particularly matter. Um, the point is if, if you've tried to do the meeting thing and it hasn't felt good, uh, what I would tell anybody who's trying to go to meetings is I would say go to uh, at least uh, that meeting three nights, uh, three weeks in a row, because one night could just be an off night. And I would also say try to find at least five different formats of meetings that you're going to, to experience everything that it potentially has to offer. There are certain types of 12-step meetings that I can't stand. I can't stand them. Um, and there's other ones that I'm excited every week to go to. So uh, that you've got to kind of navigate on your own. But usually what happens is, because we're creatures of habit, uh, and that means really we're lazy, we don't ever try to experience that new thing. Right? Like when I go to the Indian restaurant and order food, I get the exact same meal every time I go, almost every week, right? with my wife. She gets the exact same thing, because we're comfortable with that. Right? Um, you've got to be able to find different things and find different avenues. Uh, my name's Tom. Uh, when I came to the, to the rooms, uh, I didn't think 12-step programs were a good idea. I thought it was like, uh, I was in just enough pain in order to get to, to the rooms. And then I found out uh, in AA that uh, I got two choices. To either die this alcoholic addict death or live along spiritual lines. Why do I always get two terrible choices? You know exactly. what I mean? <laughs> and then all of a sudden, uh, in NA, they start talking about a new way of life. You know, they promise this new way of life. When is that new way of life? I mean, I don't, the, I'm not talking about the cycle mm. of in and out Freedom. of detoxes and Freedom. we have. Yeah, but what does it look like? Freedom. Imagine, imagine the bounds that freedom gives. That's what it gives. When I think of freedom, I think of not being held back. I think of being able to go anywhere and do anything. And if, and if I screw that up, being willing to accept those consequences for what it is. And then moving forward again. Right? True, true freedom. Uh, I mean, my experience is every one of the dreams I've ever had uh, prior to getting sober came so or came true by the time I was five years sober. And then I needed new dreams, so those dreams came true. And then I needed new, right? So that's freedom. Uh, 
it says in the literature, the 12 steps of practice as a way of life, remove the obsession to use and enable the sufferer to become happily and usefully whole. If practice as a way of life. Yeah. <coughs> All I ever wanted was to be happily and usefully whole, whatever that looked like. You know, and for me, that was coupled with freedom. You know, being able to hold a job, being able to pay my bills. I, I remember my, my first apartment in, in sobriety, my own. I had a TV in the living room. I had a kitchen table and a toaster oven and a microwave. Uh, upstairs, I had a bed and a filing cabinet and a dresser. I would come home from work. I was a landscaper. I would come home from work. I'd take a shower. I'd go down to the living room. I'd lay a blanket on the floor, take a pillow from my bed, and I'd lay on the floor. And I'd watch TV happier than the pig and shit. Excuse my language. <laughs> you know? Uh, I was free. I was absolutely free. Bruce, I'm an addict. Hey, Bruce. Uh, I was with Lean Gate on January 15th, <clears throat> 2016. I never tried to get clean. And then I finally, my son was born, so I got clean. I went to NA, and like he said, freedom. I don't know what freedom meant. People hugging me, I don't know what I'm touching them. You know, so they love me. But those two years before I relapsed, I relapsed in uh, early January after I was just one, two years. But in those two beautiful years, I got my son back. They said, if you stay in that program, you will find a new way to live and not suffer. That's what I found there. But once I stopped going eating, I stopped listening, I tried to go on my own, stopped calling anybody, I came back to that dark place and I ended up using, you know. So now, you know, I'm getting back to being free, you know, and that's, that's the, the beautiful thing about it. That, that was my freedom. Like, you know, like you said, I gave Anybody else? You forget what I talked about? <laughs> what did he say? I'm not a gorilla. All right. Um, you want to do anything? Yes. Yeah. Awesome. Thank, Thank you, you everybody. Very, very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. So much great information. Um, I want to piggyback on the hope side of things in that knowledge is power. Um, we want to announce an event that we're coming, that's coming up for us. Um, too many times when it comes to disease of addiction, people focus on the travesties that happen. And here at Hope Sheds Light, we're about the hope and recovery that happens because we're here to celebrate recovery, celebrate life. So we are launching an event. It's called a Day of Hope, and it's May 12th. Stop by our Facebook page, check it out, come and attend. There's flyers out in the um, lobby. Um, there's also t-shirts out there. We have t-shirts from our last year's walk. Stop by, get some. If you have a special size that you want us to bring next time, just reach out to me, give me a shout out, and I'll grab your size so we can have t-shirts for you. Okay? Um, we have the surveys that are going out. Our wonderful girl Taylor is uh, passing out the surveys. And then we're going to break out into our small groups. And the color of beads determine which group that you're in. Okay? All right. Thank <laughs> you.